Hey guys, welcome back to another video in this Flame game development series where we are making a 2D platformer using the Flame engine. In the last section, we saw how to design levels using tiled and then display them in our Flame game using tiled component. And we also wrote some code which will help us later on to switch between levels. But right now, these levels are pretty much empty and useless. So in this section, I'm going to show you how to spawn characters or components to be precise in these levels. But for this, first we need to define the position of each component that we want to spawn in the TMX level files. So I'll quickly open up the tiled editor. Here you can see that on the right side, we have a layer section and right now it has only one layer called tile layer 1. Layers in Tiled work very similar to how they do in GIMP or Photoshop. Basically, you can design your level using multiple layers with each layer holding similar elements. So, we are going to use a separate layer to mark the position and size information of each character in the level. To create a new layer, click on this new layer icon located below the layer section. Here, you can see that we are presented with multiple types of layers. You can read about each of them in the official docs of Tiled, but the most important ones are Tile Layer and Object Layer. Tile Layers are for laying out tiles in the map, and we have already used them for creating levels. Object Layer, on the other hand, are useful for storing metadata such as spawn points and navigation paths that cannot be necessarily represented in Tile Layer. For our case, we need an Object Layer. So I'll select that and then I'll rename this new object layer to spawn points. Later on, we'll use the same name in code to fetch the data from TMX file and spawn components. Okay, so once you create and select this object layer, you'll notice that some new tools become active at the top here. Using these tools, you can place some simple objects like points, rectangle and circles in the level. For example, the most basic object that you can create is a point. Once you place that in the map, it will be represented by this pin and on the left side, you can see all the properties of this object. So using a point object, you can mark a position in the map. And then in your code, you can get the X and Y coordinates of this point to maybe spawn some game objects. Now. Although a point would have been enough for marking the initial positions of player, enemy and coins, I will not use that. Instead, I'll use the rectangle object. This is because if we use a rectangle, we can use the width and height of that rectangle to define the size of characters in game. This will allow us to scale them by just modifying the level files. So using this rectangle tool, I'll draw a 32 by 32 pixel square here to represent the player start point. Now while reading this data in code, we need to be able to differentiate this object from all the other objects in the layer. And to help us do that, we can use the type property of this object. So I'll just set the value of type property of this object to player. Then next, for marking position of a coin, I'll create one more square on this platform and set its type to coin. If you want to duplicate an existing object, just select that object and press Ctrl D. Then you can drag the duplicated object to its new location. I'll quickly create some more coins like this. And finally, for spawning a door, which will take players to the next level, I'll create a bigger square at the end of the level. Let's set the type property of this object to door. Okay. So this much information is enough for us to go ahead and start spawning these objects in game from code. But looking at the level, you can already tell that there is no way to guess which square represents which game object visually. They all are just a bunch of squares. So to avoid this confusion, we can use the insert tile tool. It basically allows you to place tiles in the object layer to help visualize the level better. On activating this tool, you just have to select a tile from the tile set and then you can place it anywhere in the level. So I'll place this player tile on first square. Similarly, I'll do it for rest of the objects as well. 
Now, technically speaking, instead of using rectangle object for marking positions and then placing these tiles on them, we could have directly placed the tiles and used them for position as well. This is because these tiles are also objects having properties like X, Y, Width, Height and Type. But the main reason why I didn't do it that way is because the anchor point or origin for rectangle objects and tile objects do not seem to be the same. This means for a rectangle object and a tile object placed exactly on top of each other, the coordinates do not match. So to avoid unnecessary confusions, I am using rectangles as spawn locations and tile objects just to visualize the game objects in level editor. But anyways, I will repeat the same steps and mark locations for all the objects in level 2 as well. And this time I will also place two enemies in the level with their type property set to enemy. Ok, so now that the levels are properly marked, let's save them and go back to our project code. Here, I will quickly launch the game on emulator to show you that adding object layers does not actually change how the level is displayed in game. You can see that both the levels are still looking exactly the same as before. But all the data that we added in object layer is now available in the tile component and we can read that data in our level class. So before we can start reading that data, let's just create a new class which will represent the player character. For that, I'll create a new subdirectory under game called actor. This will store all the game object classes like player, enemy, coin and door. But for now, let's create a new file named player.dart. Inside this file, I'll create a new class called player extending from sprite component. Sprite component is again a class that Flame provides using which we can display sprites or images in the game world. Now whenever you extend a flame component, always try to define a constructor with all the parameters exposed by the base class and then forward them to super. You never know when you might need to use one of those optional parameters in future. In this case, I know that sprite component has a named constructor called from image, which accepts an image as input and I'm going to need that constructor. So what I'll do is. I'll go to the definition of sprite component dot from image and I'll copy this whole parameter list and add it to my player constructor. And let's import the required files for image class here. Now we can start going through each parameter one by one. First one is image, which we'll get as input, so I'll leave it as it is. Next is the source position. This defines the top left corner of sprite that we want to draw from the input image. In our case, since the player sprite is right at the start, the top left will be 0, 0. So I'll set the source position to vector2.0 and we'll remove this parameter from player constructor because it is never going to change for player. Similarly, next we have source size, which defines the size of sprite that we want to draw. In our case, we know that sprites are 32 by 32 pixels in size. So I'll set this to vector2.all32. This is also not going to change, so I'll remove it from player constructor. And for rest of the parameters, I'll just forward them as it is to base class. So this much code is enough in the player class for it to at least spawn in the game. Now let's go back in level.dart. Here, after the level is added, We'll call the get object from layer method on level.tilemap. Given a layer name, this method returns the object layer from the map. So here, I'll pass in the name as spawn points and store the return value as spawn points layer. Next, we can get all the objects in this layer using spawn points layer dot objects. So I'll put that in a for loop and reference each object as spawn point. Inside this for loop, I'll add a switch block and switch over spawn point dot type. This is the same type property that we had set to player, enemy, coin and door. Since right now we only have a player class, I'll add a case for player. Inside this case, we can now create an object of player class. But as you can see, this class needs an image as input 
and we haven't yet written code to load the sprite sheet. So let's do that now. For this, let's go back to game.dat file. Here in the onload method, just before setting the viewport, I'll use images.load and load spritesheet.png. Now load returns a future of image. So I'll await for it to complete and then store the loaded image in a late image member called sprite sheet. This will make sure that we load and keep a reference to the sprite sheet before starting the game. Now back in level.dat, to get the stored sprite sheet reference from our main game class, I'll add the has game ref mixin to this level class with type parameter as simple platformer. This mixin ensures that level can access the parent game class instance. So now in the player constructor, we can pass in the image as game ref dot sprite sheet. But just passing in the sprite sheet is not enough. We also need to place the player at correct location as defined by the spawn point. To do that, I'll set the position parameter to a vector2 with spawn point.x and spawn point.y as input. Similarly, I'll set the size parameter to vector2 of spawn point.width and spawn point.height. And as the last step, I'll just add this player to the level using add method. Now if we go back to the emulator, you can see that the player sprite is spawned at the correct location. If I switch to level 2, you can see that it is working for this level as well. So this is pretty much all there is to spawning components using object layer. All that remains now is to create classes for coin, enemy and door similar to player class and then add a case for each one of them in level.dat. The only thing that needs to be modified for each class is the source position. To be precise, only the x coordinate of source position needs to be modified because sprites in the sprite sheet are arranged horizontally in a single row. And given that all of them are of the same size, you can easily define the x coordinate as sprite index multiplied by 32. For example, for the coin class, since the coin sprite is at third index, you can write source position as vector2 of 3 times 32 comma 0. But anyways, as the rest of the video is just me copying, pasting and renaming stuff, I don't think there is anything worth explaining here. So I'll leave the rest up to you and end this video here. But in case you get stuck somewhere, you can go and check the GitHub repository of this project linked in the description. That being said, I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new. If you did, do hit that like button and maybe consider subscribing for more such content. I hope to see you in the next one.